Investiamo nel presente, prima raggiungiamo il futuro. Questa è l'idea che ci spinge ogni giorno a muovere il nostro paese verso la ripresa, a dare a tutti nuovi percorsi da seguire, a usare l'innovazione per essere più liberi di crescere, a esportare la nostra eccellenza italiana nel mondo, ad anticipare i cambiamenti per costruire un domani più sostenibile con tutti voi. Perché il futuro è la nostra destinazione solo se è un viaggio che facciamo insieme. Investiamo nel presente, prima raggiungiamo il futuro. Questa è l'idea che ci spinge ogni giorno a muovere il nostro paese verso la ripresa, a dare a tutti nuovi percorsi da seguire, a usare l'innovazione per essere più liberi di crescere, a esportare la nostra eccellenza italiana nel mondo, ad anticipare i cambiamenti per costruire un domani più sostenibile con tutti voi. Perché il futuro è la nostra destinazione solo se è un viaggio che facciamo insieme. Buonasera. Good evening. Even the only thing worse than this crisis is the risk of wasting it, is how Pope Francis very efficiently summarized the struggle we're all living. Covid, which we're still fighting now, risks, uh, puts into risk our own survival. It's forcing us to come face to face with something. First of all, the risk of losing our own life, both on a personal and a collective level. And it make, forces us to ask ourselves a question. Is what I do strictly necessary? These efforts that take so much of my time, are they really worth it? The Pope reminds us that this crisis we're living through is an amazing opportunity to deepen these questions, these very wise and uncomfortable, terrible questions that often we don't want to ask ourselves, but we should. But from this challenge, political institutions are not exempt. But in these two years, the question has returned, is politics still useful? Now that the future of our lives, both in terms of health and the chance of collective well-being, economic growth, social and cultural growth, now that all of this is up for debate, are our institutions still able to uh, demonstrate their raison d'etre? Do they have a way to improve our own lives? And above all, in times of uncertainty like the ones we're living in now, can we still trust these institutions? I advise you, this question was very present already before the pandemic. It was uh, started by the economic crisis of the early 2000s, but the health emergency has accelerated in an exponential way this question. And in my opinion, we need to be careful to exchange reasonable questions like these with a superficial or nonchalant attitude towards our political institutions, our, which is the territory of culture, of populism, and of protests, I think many times 
this not taking these questions seriously, this not taking the, uh, the opportunity for change which these questions represent, the causes of a lot of distrust and uh, hatred towards politics. We should be aware that when faced with these challenges, there are two possible attitudes. First is the, those who take the opportunity of this crisis to change and those who dramatically waste this opportunity, to use the, the Pope's own turn of phrase. Often our political institutions have usually fall in this second category rather than the first. Today, and we're very grateful, we've got some very preeminent political figures and public servants here with us today, and together with them we want to ask ourselves well, are we wasting this crisis, or is it rather a, an excellent chance to, to make the most of? So because of this, I'd want to thank deeply for accepting our invitation, the President of the European Parliament, uh, the Honourable David Sass Davide Sassoli. Thank you, Mr. President. Together with President Sassali, we have with us two other eminent guests. First of all, uh, joining us remotely, the President of Friuli Venezia Giulia region and the President of our State Regions Conference, Massimiliano Federiga. Thank you for coming. Lastly, the third guest isn't... Uh, a member of the political world, although he was a member of one of the most important uh, bodies in our uh, republic, the Constitutional Court. He's a professor at university, Sabino Cassese, who joins us remotely. I thank you for joining us. Professor Cassese, without, I hope I'm not exaggerating, one of the most uh, competent experts in the study of in political science, in how their politics operates and in its history. And given this, it's not always, academics don't always agree on this, but he's a, a widely known and appreciated researcher across the whole world. For a few years now, he's been a good friend of the meeting and has been helping us to confront these, these themes. It's a reflection on these themes. In a recent book of his called Good Government, um, he talks about a great, uh, he quotes, only, it's only institutions that uh, design how the state is structured, who distribute uh, roles that must be done. The well-being of a society depends on these institutions, so we need to start from the institutions and not the economy. The structure of our wider society conforms to our institutions, not the economy. In, uh, in fact, it's governed by its institutions. This is a, it seems paradoxical, this affirmation, but now we all agree that it's very important to restart the economy, but lasting economic growth requires uh, a political structure that's up to the job. And now it seems like uh, finally, uh, enough money is being put in properly and we're seeing how decisive public administration and how important it can be. Only with better institutions can we emerge from this crisis and therefore I'd like I come to the theme we're talking about for this uh, conference. We've all seen uh, an, um, an incredible process by which this magic uh, process of obtaining better um, political structures is by assigning them to individual people or substituting these organisms uh, in their complexity and uh, inefficiency with single people in the political world. It's a form of the personalization of politics or like we put in the title the verticalization of power. Bureaucracy and its apparatus is often perceived as a cost or as a loss of time, of resources, while the desire, people's desire to choose is uh, definitively has grown. 
the question of uh, so simple solutions has grown to very complex questions. Politicians have pushed this greatly and to get the support of the people seeing themselves as, the re as channeling the desire of the people and stemming from communication, understanding the, the lack of um, intermediaries now, politics is a lot more direct. Our founding fathers imagined were a, a very element structural to our democracy at home, in the factory, political parties, in school, uh, religious com uh, inclinations, these places where everyone learnt the art of politics. Now the lack of intermediaries seems to be the, the state of the times. We have to uh, present two institutions which are emblematic of the two alternatives. On one side, the European Parliament, uh, one of the biggest uh, representative bodies in the world, whose president is elected at the, uh, sent, uh, internally in the assembly. On the other hand, regions by whom their president is elected directly by the people. And although designed with different structures and procedures, they're two different ex uh, expressions of democracy. And they play different roles in their own structures. Once elected, the presidents don't represent a single part of society, not just their own party, but they're called to uh, re represent everyone, the common good of the organization they're running. And yet now there's a huge push for politicians to be uh, outwardly identifiably of one political affiliation. So how can we take such great political institutions and in these days of the verticalization of power to start this, I'd like to start with the contribution of, uh, of, of Sassoli, the president of the, the court, one of the most important representative institutions of Europe and of our modern history. And because of this, I'm very thankful to, to call to the, the podium right now, President Sassoli of the European Parliament. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the invite. As it, as it has been for time, uh, for a long time, the meeting invites us to perform complex reflections. In this time, the the important balance is, especially, to understand these dynamics, which nowadays. Uh, we are confronted with very often. The situation is ever more complicated now. The same idea given to us, the courage to say I, lends itself to different conclusions according to the situation in which this desire to reinforce our own responsibility is declined to not compromise the originality of every single person, to increase everyone's participation in social life. It doesn't hide from anyone. It's aware to everyone that the, the COVID crisis, it's so dramatic and so deep, uh, represents a, water, a watershed from the world we know, which we grew to know, uh, is now a different situation, which we still struggle to understand or to interpret how do we identify our own presence within it? A lot still escapes us now. And we understand that the wheels of history cannot be turned back to return to the, what, how the world was before. We're given a sense of, uh, of great fear which pr presents us, which prohibits us from, from moving on. We shouldn't have fear of crises. We shouldn't uh, 
return to a kind of uh, opportunism or pacifism, refusing to, op to move on, it's a chance of great opportunity because everything we've built in the second part of the 1900s, developing our countries, our democracies, our freedoms, is now uh, called into question with global, uh, very dangerous global processes and very uh, complicated ones. Our idea of a person, of the inviolability of human life, the affirmation of universal human rights, the inspiration to the integral development of a person are the ingredients with which we present ourselves to new challenges. Will they be sufficient? The outlook of a new uh, humanism is certainly possible, but it's not, uh, it's not definite. We should all thank President Mattarella, who's, who was here at the meeting, uh, launched the, the need to update our own personal person. We need to have an outlook that's up to the challenge of this this contemporary challenge we're facing now. And together, we we need uh, witnesses, witnesses of flesh and blood, with individual stories of friendship, of challenges. What's some of the staff of Pope Francis is teaching is very important for Catholics here that even it's said among Catholics that they they fall on they fall and they they let themselves get rolled over by these wider waves radical evangelism is stronger than a kind of than any doctrine and it it questions our consciences deeply and it calls us to be faithful day by day to the encounter with another who is weaker than ourselves and it challenges us to be uh, present with a kind of building spirit in our own history so we know it's a it's a gift not kind of not an egoism that's that presumes itself to be hegemonous of everything It's this eye that builds communities, that rends it, uh, makes them stronger, that makes the I, the person indivisible from social life, from that it's in the political intermediaries and freedom. Freedom is not divisible. There isn't personal freedom without the freedom of your own neighbors. There's no freedom if next to us there's exploitation and slavery. There's no freedom if next to us there's a greater exploitation and of people's freedoms, and there's no freedom without the freedom of every community. Uh, Gal Moren wrote very well, who recently uh, has turned 100, we reflect that the only thing capable of protecting our liberty is the, pres the constant presence in the spirit of its members and of their belonging to a community in solidarity and of a sentiment of, resp of responsibility in, with regards to this community. The pandemic tells us many things about ourselves. It's revealed a lot. It's made us see just how much we rely on others, but also just how possible it is to reconnect politics with people. It's demonstrated us to us clearly uh, what tools are useful for challenging uh, new struggles. And at the same time, we see our own fragility, that we're, how we're inefficient and where we need to improve. The COVID crisis tells us in what our democ European democracy needs to improve, what it needs to do to get better. And in how the relationship between the EU and the nation states needs to change. The lessons of COVID are many. Let's not lock them away. First, the person. It's still the most important thing and no geopolitical struggle, no crisis can uh, rob us of the desire to protect our own identity. We should know, however, that we can't do this alone. As 
we did uh, after the Second World War, or how we believed it was possible to do in the West, uh, looking inwards towards ourselves. We are hopeful, we're trusting, because in contrast to the because the pandemic in Europe could have led to very different things without the choices that were made by our institutions communally. Without the EU, we would have had conflict between our nations on vaccine development, on health policy, on what, on the help to those who are without work. Uh, we would have lost Schengen, we would have re, uh, lifted the borders once again, we couldn't have, have shared the debt, and there wouldn't have been a powerful help to national economies. We would have been alone. The tragedy has promoted a real revolution in European response, a revolution in five steps, and I want to summarize them here. First, the rules of fiscal compact have been suspended until 2022, and we're now working on a post-COVID scenario. We need rules, but new rules. Secondly, with the EU, nation states have increased uh, substantially their relationship and their GDP to defend what? Families, businesses, from an economic crisis and social crisis that's been produced by the pandemic. Thirdly, we've seen, the, we've lived through this paradox of never, of never having had access to so many resources for investment in such a moment of crisis like this. This has never happened before and has never, it never came through. And a form of sharing this risk through members, between member states that before the, uh, the pandemic were staunch, was staunchly uh, prohibited, was totally excluded. Fourth, central banks have bought up to 25% of public deeds of member states. The, cent the European Central Bank plans, if necessary, to come to the 33% avoiding in this way that the increase of public debt transforms into a, a crisis on, uh, in financial markets. The purchasing of these deeds by the, the central bank has raised, has increased debt in a sustainable way. Fifth, all this has been possible because of a good, uh, conditionality on the use of uh, available money. Uh, resources of the uh, the plan for national recovery, are put, uh, the resources need to have been spent well and will, should be spent well with precise objectives like that of the digitalization of the eco-crisis and uncertain times that have defined it and have pushed, uh, founded the EU and pushed over and even the institution I preside over will be pushed to, uh, to oversee this and to be careful. My friends, this experiment has had great, has been an overwhelming success. Family owned businesses have been helped as much as possible, rendering this crisis very different to those of 2009. It's a revolution, it's a macroeconomic revolution that has made so that resources are now available and that the damage will be lessened thanks to the active role of the, Econ of the European Central Bank and of the wider state banks. In 2009, you'll remember, the financial crisis burnt uh, through its evaporated private savings and the south of the uh, European economic area was uh, not allowed to recover in its with expansive monetary policy, but rather now this crisis has been symmetrical. All countries in the EU have organized between them, knowing that they're going to find them, they're on the same boat together, has been the policy. And fiscal and monetary policy has avoided the destruction of private savings and has made monetary resources available. Think about savings. Uh, in Italy, in banks have increased by over 90 billion. And this is 
part of the fuel for the national recovery we're seeing now. We're entering into never-before-seen territory. And now we've discovered that macroeconomic stability can hold, it would be certainly a uh, it would be crazy to go back. Just think about what it what it would mean to restore the the initial idea of the central compact and encourage our countries to come together on a a GDP uh, compact of sixty percent. It would be a way to kill families and businesses, to strangle all nation states, to bring the EU to its knees, ultimately. And it's also essential that these five steps that I've just outlined are underlined and implemented properly. And here the question becomes truly a political one, because the real challenge, and we see it in a, a lot of different sectors, to, we see a pressure to move back to the rules of before. But we should remain conscious that what was done during the pandemic needs to become the new uh, economic policy of the EU. For this is a question of need. These resources, this uh, policy put into place by the EU need to, to end with the, the ending of this health crisis and economic crisis like many uh, both conservative and liberal forces are pushing for. And that this fight in the pandemic uh, against the pandemic and the social crisis need to transform needs to transform into a new framework for public policy and as a consequence in a renewing an institutional renewing of europe uh, in a communal fashion the answer to this question isn't uh, a game it's a question that that from which all other questions stem because from the conclusions that we will draw, even our own capacity uh, to confront climate change, this great project of, uh, of a green revolution we've been, uh, that we've promised to do as European nations in the coming years, but not only this, confirming decisions that have been made to make them permanent now will consent the EU to assume uh, political personality in the international scene and in these days in these weeks uh, we're aware of how, just how important this is it's fundamental if it wasn't if we hadn't abandoned the structures the rules the paradigms which were in place only two years ago we would have been right now at the beginning we would now be, a, be in play, we would have been able to obtain the results that we were looking for, that we have been seeing. This is the, the great historical challenge we have ahead of us. The challenge uh, through the Next Generation EU project gives us a great chance. It lets us put down roots in a new economic uh, politics of growth and development for everyone in the next two or three years. We, we uh, lay down, we plan ahead our prospects for the next 20 years, something that can't be, we can't run from. The success or a failure depends a lot on Italy. If Italy can demonstrate in a, a, vir a virtuous manner that the recovery plan money uh, can be used properly, these five steps founded on the exchange of expansive political ideals with intervention of, uh, of European bodies uh, using proper resources can allow these new pages to be written. This Euro new European experience, which uh, all or many of us uh, has been, which has been extinguished for most of us, it allows us to confront these, uh, the risks of this new world responsibly and coherently. Well, uh, a failure or any failure would cost Italy dearly, but it would cost the European project far more. 
to think to put in uh, what happened in this emergency, ignoring this and returning to our previous uh, policies would uh, risk putting Italy uh, and the EU as a whole into a, a never-before-seen crisis uh, down to its very foundations. Uh, the point of history to live this crisis properly, you know, we've been through a crisis now, but now we can plan ahead thanks to the work of, our inst Euro of European and national institutions now we can plan forwards for our new Europe and for a renewed, stronger Italy in a renewed, stronger Europe. This is the, the real, the, the essential point of this, this phase, the core of the question now of our agenda. In Italy, we have a government that, from which we've asked stability, and this certainly is the, the premise for everything. A government which isn't the expression of a traditional political framework, but it would be—it wouldn't be correct, in my opinion, at least—to to shut its experience to a state of it because it was a temporary exception. To ignore it because of this would be wrong. This is—it's uh, fundamental for Europe that uh, the times that. National politics needs to be synchronized, and this same concept of stability, which we've seen in Italy, cannot be reduced to only exhorting, uh, to be exhorted to in moments of crisis. The needs of the, the country, which in my opinion uh, are the same as the whole, the wider European interest, and which uh, European change is dedicating itself to, many of these new structures should become permanent. It's in our interest, and that's why I think the mission, the aim of the government shouldn't end now in completing the vaccination program, in the recovery plan. I think they're important, but it should look to the stabilization of European development, of the European project as a whole. Italy is now a political project, and not only a condition to face a, a difficult period, Stability makes sense because it helps to consolidate what we've seen in Europe and by consequence our investments in our policies of national balance and social uh, stability. Before the pandemic, to govern European uh, institutions there were, there were rules uh, that punished solidarity in the name of some abstract rigour which uh, halted development broadly and therefore the growth of the continent as part of a Euro this wider European competition. We can put roots now with the Green Deal and with all these structures you, we all know and to reinforce it with these the structures and the tools which have been uh, made available in all of our countries Consensus, it allows us now to adopt a real strategy of change. We could allow ourselves to say that when the crisis has ended, Europe can, can Europe become what it was before, return to what it was before? Many of us are convinced that the, the Green Deal should show its effects, that the fiscal union should take new institutional forms, more communitary, with uh, less veto power, with more synergy between nation states which share the principles of freedom and democracy, that the spirit of uh, solidarity can be allowed to develop a communal, that common policies that's useful for our countries and our public uh, efforts. If our economies are developed and if society is developed, it would have more power to uh, propel democratic values that underline our society. I was in Latvia, Lithu uh, Lithuania and Estonia in the, Balt uh, in the Baltic states that are facing a challenge uh, with the integrity of our own borders. The, t the question of security of European space uh, that's threatened by cyber attack, that threaten our uh, 
our way of life and our democracies, uh, defending ourselves is a, a priority which we, we cannot joke uh, isn't happening. We need to stand up to it. We can't allow ourselves to, in the face of humanitarian crisis, which ask of us in the Mediterranean and now, for example, in Afghanistan, we have to face up to this. It's clear that the Afghanistan crisis has to do with Europe. The defeat of the West puts in de into question our own identity in, the global co in a global context. But can we become spectator, impotent spectators in this? Uh, there are fears tied to the choosing of new leaders. The, wo uh, the wounded pride of our people risks uh, to be dis simply dispersed into the air without a new sense of common responsibility of the EU. It's not a question of separating things now, rather the opposite. We must put together a new balance in which Europe is finally able to put together what now, until now it hasn't yet, foreign policy and defense policy. In an attempt to, in anticipating, th understanding better what the steps if we need to take in future need to be faced with the new Afghanistani government, we can only think of an ethical policy. We must make every effort now to ensure the, sec the safety of all those who in these 20 years have helped us, who believed in us. If we believe like we believe in the strength of our, our diplomacy, we'll always be able to open new dialogues, even with those who are far from us. Uh, by. Uh, geographically and ideologically but we have there has to be two people to talk everyone has to be willing to sit down there's no point if they are if those on the other side are not willing to spoke to, to speak to us our solidarity is the foundation of our responses now both in rebuilding common in terms of rebuilding common european policy health policy Without a, a common European policy for health, how could we face up to the next crises, which uh, will surely arise after COVID-19? Without a common security policy, we'll be vulnerable, exposed to the threats of authoritarian regimes. Without a clear European policy, we cannot sustain the comparison with China, the confrontation with China. Without a European policy for Im on immigration and asylum, we won't be able to c face these, the challenges that will come in the next years from Sahel, the region to Asia. Millions and millions of people are on the move who will be looking towards Europe, to us, as a promised land and a place uh, where they can seek shelter. Italy has a, a vital role in all this, in forming the, and in the formation and, pre de and des in the new destiny of Europe both in the long and the short term, we mustn't forget this. We started from the new challenges that the global situation has uh, called us to act to, our fears of the complexity of the situation we have ahead of us, of the risks and the pression, uh, the pressure we're faced with. But it's always clear, dear friends, that we have to stick together. To us Europeans, we're asked to rewrite the rules of the global world, of the global system, and we have the chance. Yes, we have the possibility and we have to believe that this is the case. Because we're still capable of connecting the response, individual responsibility to a plausible wider space. And this space is the European sphere. We understood this before COVID. But today, COVID has made it even more evident. And we said it here at the meeting two years ago as well, that only common European sovereignty can allow to make, to give sense and space to national sovereignty. It's a, a dynamic that's been turned on its head in the process of integration. And that now, right now in this very moment is very clear. The courage to say I. For me, it 
calls up uh, a strong sense of uh, both personal and collective responsibility and of the awareness that us Europeans are called once again to participate to a, a greater uh, act of the liberation and the freeing of all peoples. Thank you. Ringrazio, ringrazio davvero di cuore il Presidente Sassoli. I thank from the bottom of my heart President Sassoli. He desired to help us here at the meeting, let his voice be heard here in our halls. He described what has happened when what happens when politics changed essentially during the pandemic. And thinking about 10 years ago, our reactions in front of Greece, it's incredible the difference that we can see in how Europe intervened in towards build, rebuilding our Europe towards our nations. I thank him also because he has described an institution, the EU, which has changed, certainly, and it is changing, it's constantly changing. And the question that I asked is, is this change only temporary? Is it only linked to this emergency? Or should it become the new policy in Europe? And this is what he has hoped for us, that this this new way of rebuilding Europe responds to our desire to, for a, a constant and stable help. And I thank him f for his observations on Afghanistan and the fundamental role that the EU will be able to play during this transition so that this transition may not be uh, going backwards, but forward, looking forwards. After this beautiful witness, this very powerful uh, testimony, I would like to uh, go to our other two guests. And I thank the meeting for giving us the chance to dialogue with them, to have a dialogue with them. The first is uh, Cassese, Professor Cassese. I'd like to ask, from your point of view, in your opinion, let me just move over here so you can see him. I can see you very well here on our screen. Of course, in person would be totally different, but we will make do. I wanted to ask, from your point of view, in your opinion, uh, considering, I mean, you're is someone who knows these institutions inside and out, there are, these changes are certainly great changes. You, you will agree. They're changing the structure uh, in order to respond to the needs of societies, people, emergencies, problems. These changes uh, and the way that our institutions are facing them. What exactly are these transformations? How has this relationship be between democracy and power change, change. How do you describe what's happening in general in our time? I'll do. So going back to how you began this meeting uh, with Pope Francis's quote, Helmut Schmidt was uh, not a chancellor at the time and in Germany, and he said the following sentence, Europe lives on, lives off crises. And this was then recalled by Jean Monnier, a great creator, founder of the European Union, by saying, 
not only does Europe live off crises, but the solutions that will be given to these crises will then be the building blocks of the construction, the foundation of Europe. This is very important regarding what we have just heard uh, with great passion, uh, what has been described to us by President Sassoli. He has focused on the most important point, which is that of the uh, consolidation of the conditions uh, in order to uh, overcome this crisis. Let's look at this problem, which is threefold. It, what exactly does verticalization of power actually consist in? The second problem is, what effects does this produce uh, on our democracies? And how can we face this verticalization of power? The first as aspect, which is the morphology of the verticalization of power, let's face this one. So we we have 2,000 different regulatory systems globally. So uh, we have decided to base our power, our state power, on an institution which is not stately but uh, super national. And of course, uh, the singular only one person from each nation can participate in this institution. So there is a personalization of and verticalization of power. The president uh, of our uh, parliament, of our um, government, Draghi, will be present. And we could say that there is a centralization of the function. There is a centralization of the decision also on how uh, vaccinations were uh, bought and produced. The EU decided to help and provide vaccinations all across Europe. Instead, of um, making the nations compete against each other. The EU helped us a lot in this. To stop nationals, uh, national states squabbling between each other, the EU pushed for unity. Our spending power has therefore been unified. Uh, the EU was a giant in terms of regulating our finance. And with the European Commission and the Euro bonds, we have now the European Union has become a huge intermediary, a financial intermediary with the re redistribution of its resources. The internal, we could say domestic um, consequences of this is are the crises on a party level. So the organization, uh, the organizational aspect, parties as a social entity, the sections of uh, small towns organization on a lower level the uh, local committees, all of this now hardly exists. The number of Italians has, uh, w the European, the Italian population has increased in 70 years uh, by 10 million, but now the people involved in politics are only an eighth of those that were uh, engaged in politics 70 years ago. So the parties have become leaders. There's a sort of leaderization. They have become too prominent. And this is what 
So we have a crisis at the level of our political parties. Everybody is free to associate themselves with a political party. And this is a part of the constitution that was emphasized. It is this uh, associative quality, the possibility to associate oneself with a party is what is now uh, uh, declining. The, our, this culture comes from, uh, it has a double uh, reason. Uh, it has a functional uh, motive, a functional uh, reason from a health point of view, vaccines, and it also has a personal reason. The, the in terms of, it is always one person who goes to represent a single state. A whole state is represented by one person only. And we could also talk about the effects of all of this. They are negative and positive. So they constitute an element of particip participation. The fact that the prime minister m can participate in events and that other uh, political um, figures can also, for example, a foreign trade minister can also, this is very positive, the fact that they can all participate. It's, we could compare it to a building assembly in a, an apartment block. Everybody must participate. Uh, the measure in which these figures participate, uh, however, takes away power from uh, the intermediary uh, or, um, organizations. So what can we do to contrast this phenomenon? How can we rebalance, create a balance between the top, the highest parts of this power, this verticalized power, and the bottom part of the pyramid of this power. So we had a socialization of power rather than a verticalization of power in the past. I'd like to make a, an, an example, a great uh, French politician from the last century, exactly a century ago. However, he was a trade unionist originally. He said that uh, a government should not only have representatives uh, from the political uh, sphere, but also representatives of the trade unions and employees and employers. And now, thanks to this, there is a, a three-party, a, a three-part, uh, tripartite organization, thanks to the observations of this political French politician, this uh, politi French political figure. I'd also like to mention something that was brought up at the beginning, um, the question of the ex exploitation of democracy. The most important thing, step, has been forgotten from the United Nations, a document in which a right, a human right was affirmed. It was the right of the people to democracy, people for democracy. The situation 
of all those who were had doubts um, can, regarding whether democracy could be transported, transplanted in certain areas. And then all of this had been overturned. And then we have a situation, another problem uh, regarding the morphology, the um, structure of power. So considering partici the participation in politics, which has declined in Italy, uh, once 80% used to take part, now only 25% of Italians take part in politics. We must trust, entrust our trust the desire which is very widespread in our country to create political schools, schools of politics, because we're realizing that politics is not or is not anymore uh, based on political parties, but it is based on something else now. And political parties and educators should support this process and support uh, this process of um, coming together. I'll come back, go back to my uh, initial point. Europe lives off crises. Let's exploit these crises, crises and take advantage of them. The uh, provisional institutions, we need them. They are necessary. Let's keep them. And regarding what Simon Chini said, can we trust these institutions? Yes, we can trust them insofar as they help people and they are useful for us, which perhaps has not always been the case in our Italian, uh, in our Italian, in our Italian political, um, on the Italian political scene. I thank you very much. Thank Professor Cassese, his observations uh, represent this balance between uh, depth of knowledge, experience, but also the capacity, the skill, the ability to innovate and to analyze the, this new situation. Uh, the phenomenon of verticalization, as he explained to us, uh, he brought us then, he tried to illustrate ser uh, solutions, possible solutions in order to regain this vitality, this enthusiasm that we have lost in politics. And it is necessary for a voice uh, in our parliament of this society be present. It is very interesting also this idea of participation. Not only should we give a space for our voices in uh, political institutions, but we should start participating in politics on a more widespread level in general. We can come to now our third speaker, Massimiliano Fedriga. Um, hopefully the connection will hold. It had a couple of issues, but thankfully you're still with us. So you're the third voice in this dialogue. President of the State Regions Conference and President of Friuli Venezia Giulia Region. So. In the institutions that uh, we have now, that in the Friuli region, uh, where the political figures have been elected by directly by the people of the region, the, it is clear that the role of these elected members 
also have to face and interact with the state. This necessity uh, for one person to drive the system. And on the other hand, you represent everybody. And you uh, have been entrusted with the role to represent everybody. So this transition that Sassoli mentioned, how do you see this phenomenon in our politics? I'd like to thank you for uh, this invite, first of all, and I want to express my um, I would prefer to be there in person with you, and hopefully next year I will be there. And thank you in advance, however, for all your uh, very interesting reflections and that are a, a, a step in the construction of the Italy of tomorrow. And we shouldn't take for granted that these dialogues happen and that while we were talking, while you were talking, I uh, wrote down a couple of notes. But I would like to respond directly to the speakers. Firstly, con uh, concerning stability. Stability is given by process, processes uh, of election, democratic elections. Un altro, diciamo, concetto. As we can see, another concept that was said, we must be very careful that stability does not become a loss of the choice of the people. The people. Quindi io penso... So I think that uh, stability needs to come through certain processes you know, both of choice uh, to choose our own institutions that therefore then our democratic institutions need to undertake certain roles. So as part of your question, I think it was a, a very virtuous model of stability this region at the regional level, whereas national governments, not you know, it's not been a problem just from the First Republic, it's been forever, has been a, an example of instability, the, the national government. And on the on a global scale, not so, uh, no country probably no or certainly not many have had as many successive governments in questions of weeks as Italy has. There is an electoral model uh, here pushed uh, driven by the president that always that should guarantee a certain level of stability of five years of um, stability here at a regional level that uh, citizens feel that they can make a proper decision of their president and based on the, the precedent that has happened in the past few years, they can tell if their government was competent or not. We need to try and take this, this uh, electoral model forwards. The electoral uh, system locally, regionally, was almost an experiment before, uh, to try and test out before moving it to the national level. And we should reflect on this. Um, we cannot just think that uh, such a fragile system uh, from a st stability point of view can guarantee, uh, an inter can guarantee international credibility for our country. And it comes from what Sassali said, and I should say a lot of, I concur with a lot of what he said. I'm particularly satisfied because in the face of those, some sometimes people defend a very rigid structure in the past now there's been a net change of pace people promoting change the pr the outlook of the eu has changed itself and with this uh, insight i think that the stability of the government is is also uh is relevant to its international stability its international role all these italian bodies these the interlocutors that professor cassisi was talking about you know, it can be on nationally or internationally, the, the consistent change of, of these intermediaries 
we no longer see a kind of fluid choice here. We see in a case that even some European countries where the stability of chancellors or of presidents and of governments has guaranteed uh, greater the greatest power of that state. So that we have a vested interest in ensuring stability. And we have to be aware that we can't have it without uh, with only good intents. We have to be aware that reform is necessary, even constitutional ones, to ensure stability is in uh, is one. Stability doesn't mean governing by foreknowledge. It means reacting well to to crises, which is something that hasn't always been possible in uh, previous governments in this country. They've entered into sort of a turbine of change of parliamentary crisis that have become part and parcel of Italy now. And without of saying, uh, we, no longer we have time to judge if you've uh, ruled well or ruled badly because you haven't ruled at all, barely. And so regions can represent an interesting model here, a model of choice. And so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try and be brief here. Sorry, I'll try and stay in the time allotted to me. I just want to conclude here for what, how it reflects to me, certainly, uh, regional politics here, which is something I'm very, I have the great honor of representing. I think we have to look at it with a, a particular, with particular attention for the, the possibility to bring together of delegating greater powers to the regions. We've seen a talk, political talk here that's wanted to use the pandemic to centralize the European Union, uh, regional governments now instead, for, for better or for worse, you know, we're in the middle of a global pandemic, but they've, they've endured. And on this, I think we need to uh, understand that there are certain skills that don't need to be put on a national level, other skills that there's no doubt need to be at a European level which is what Sassoli was telling us about, but there are certain things without a doubt that needs to stay at a local and at a regional level. It's particularly Italy, I should say, with the conformity to our country where the diversity and the cultural uh, richness, which I should say is an added value and a, it's a true speciality of our country, but we need to find specific uh, answers. We can't have answers that uh, work everywhere we need to find something we need to identify our objectives and understand them properly and with these objectives we need to find answers that uh, we've spoken about uh, public health and it's been broadly uh, helpful and we you know we've got one health system run by the central government and the exception if you allow me to reflect on this it's if it had been run locally, then there might have been different than had because it's run by the central government. We have state and regional health uh, authorities. Not only this, but I think on uh, the reconstruction plan, uh, the regions should be uh, the protagonist of this. Uh, we, sh that we, don't, we don't want regions to be ignored from this because if there isn't a, an institutional alliance here in Italy, this great responsibility we have to govern properly. I want to remind you that the recovery plan is is debt, is either direct or indirect debt, as because we might will either take part directly or as part of the European debt. So we need to take to use this as an, uh, a chance. We need to earn, to earn from this to grow, and if there isn't an, a, a wider institutional alliance, we risk greater failure. So Draghi's administration has had a kind of a shift in towards its relationship with the regions, but we need to, if we don't uh, move ahead together with this alliance, then we are going to waste this opportunity. But saying this to conclude, I think regions can be uh, and can give their own contribution as uh, in, to our republic, to the government, to the Italian government, but I also think on a, on a European level, the European Regions Conference can be a, an important tool, which I think it should be reinforced, should be strengthened. And I was part of it for a year, and as when I chaired the conference, and it's certainly important, and uh, something that helped to 
provoke a response across the whole continent, but I think there are certain institutions that alone, uh, to go back to, to Professor Cassese to conclude that alone can, uh, can be enough to, to run. So verticalizing everything, we risk a total failure of our institutions to put by putting all this power into single people. If we don't understand that institutions need to serve the people, then they need to be organized in the best way in order to give that service to the people, not in the best way to, to manage power, then they will be the first kind of situations to be rebuilt in this new world that we hope we can uh, will be born after this after the pandemic with this opportunity we need to give ourselves and we all need to to work together from the institutions to socials uh, to all sectors of society coming out rebuilding after this uh, pandemic isn't just the, ro the responsibility of the government it's the responsibility of our wider community every every single person with their own skills we have the the duty to work together to rebuild thank you for giving me this chance to speak to you io ringrazio I thank you very much once again, uh, President Federiga, for having given us this outlook of the from the regional perspective, not only for his region, but also of the the kind of wider re uh, system of the regions. And remember that only in a an, a dialogue of co of cooperation between all parts of our republic, and not only this, as we've started to uh, speak, as we started here with the the increasingly important uh, supranational organi organizations, the EU, only if there's dialogue between all of these, like Professor Cassese said, if we return to if they return to understand themselves as servants of society and not the other way around, only, uh, he, he quoted, and I'd like to end with this, that the inaugural but Mattarella's inaugural address in which he invited everyone to a new rereading of of personalization that our constitution is founded on i think the message that emerges from our uh, conference today which has as its center this the the theme of change we've seen how we've just heard how things are changing how institutions are shifting how things could change but the state and the regional level in italy the heart of this change is exactly this new centralization of the person, of, his, of their relationships. Professor Cassese said, Inst institutions for people and for society. I think it's happening that society and people, intermediaries, uh, bodies like the people who do the meeting and many other occasions, chances for dialogue and of wider social reconstruction these need to have that kind of subjectivity, which is the only antidote to this verticalization. Otherwise, we'll only be looking for overly simplified solutions to problems which, to alas, they're very complicated, they're very uh, complex. And this, uh, this shortcut isn't something that we need to do. Dialogue still has a value, confronting each other still has a value, and finding a solution that has still the greatest chance of holding together the praxis and our ideology. And now I thank President Sassoli, Professor, uh, Professor Cassese, President Federiga, and I invite you all to, uh, to continue, and I welcome you all. Uh, I hope you all have a a great continued meeting. Thank you for taking part online in this event. Thank you very much.
Investiamo nel presente, prima raggiungiamo il futuro. Questa è l'idea che ci spinge ogni giorno a muovere il nostro paese verso la ripresa, a dare a tutti nuovi percorsi da seguire, a usare l'innovazione per essere più liberi di crescere, a esportare la nostra eccellenza italiana nel mondo, ad anticipare i cambiamenti per costruire un domani più sostenibile con tutti voi. Perché il futuro è la nostra destinazione solo se è un viaggio che facciamo insieme. Più investiamo nel presente, prima raggiungiamo il futuro. Questa è l'idea che ci spinge ogni giorno a muovere il nostro paese verso la ripresa, a dare a tutti nuovi percorsi da seguire, a usare l'innovazione per essere più liberi di crescere, a esportare la nostra eccellenza italiana nel mondo, ad anticipare i cambiamenti per costruire un domani più sostenibile con tutti voi. Perché il futuro è la nostra destinazione solo se è un viaggio che facciamo insieme.